Welcome to a special edition of BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and today we're zeroing in on the 2023 AACR Annual Meeting. Joining me are... Simon Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. And Karen Tkach tesman Director of Biopharma Intelligence. All righty. Yesterday was the final day of this year's American Association for Cancer Research meeting in Orlando. And I'd like to start off by bringing Lauren in. She's led by a century's analysis of new molecular targets described in this year's AACR abstracts. Lauren, it's a lot of digging. I know you, you do this every year. What stood out to you this year? So one thing that stood out to me this year was the limited number of new immuno-oncology targets. I'm talking specifically about molecular targets where the primary mechanism is some type of immune function. In past years, we've seen a lot of excitement around new checkpoint targets or new cytokines, um, innate immune modulatory functions, and, and there wasn't much of that this year. From the 37 new targets that we found in the abstracts, and these were targets that are new to BioCentury and um, that are not addressed by any programs that we're aware of in the clinic or in preclinical development. Um, there was just one that had you know, a very clear and direct primary immune modulating function. There are also two that are proposed as targets for CAR T-cell therapies. So these are sort of tumor antigens that don't have an immune function, but would be a target of an immune cell therapy. Lauren, so you've come out with a relatively provocative idea, I think, that immuno-oncology may be losing its luster. And I wanted to dig into that a little bit with you because Part of me feels like, well, is it just that there've been a lot of new immunology, immuno-oncology targets, and even the ones that are known, and now the field is trying to flesh out the details. It's trying to make those work. Would we expect it to keep coming up with new targets? And Karen, you may weigh in on this as well. Or is there sort of an expectation that, yeah, there's just going to keep getting new and newer and newer targets all the time as a field grows? Well, in cancer in general, you, you keep seeing new targets emerging. I mean, as we see, there are 37 new ones at this conference that, that I was able to find. So I don't know if immuno-oncology is any different. Obviously, these targets have sort of different functions than some of the other types of things we're looking at for cancer. But one trend that we have seen in the IO field is trying to optimize the way that we're using the existing targets that we have. Like CTLA-4 is a great example of, you know, the first immune checkpoint target that was drugged. And now there's a ton of activity against that target, trying to find safer ways to make MABs and, and make these more effective for more patients. So there's still a ton of activity in immuno-oncology. I think the controversial title of the story is just raising the question of, of whether or not more, more targets are going to continue to be found. And Lauren, I'm curious, among the non-immuno-oncology targets, what kinds of biological mechanisms were you seeing? There were a few different mechanisms. One that emerged as, as sort of a primary group was the metabolic targets. And this is something that has been a popular area of cancer research for a long time. And I think it's interesting that it's continuing so much. These were pretty focused on tumor metabolism, but we've also sort of seen this parallel field emerging of immunometabolism, where you're trying to modulate the immune function, the metabolic function of the immune cells to make them more effective at, at killing cancer. So that wasn't really represented in, in these targets, but that's a, another area that we've been following through these conferences. And there was also a lot of gene regulation stuff, which is is obviously something that's kind of a hot area in cancer, different ways to control protein expression at the RNA level or the gene level with transcription modulators or, or translation modulators. All right, Karen, now this is not a new target this year. PRMT5, I sure wish there was a sort of a sexier roll off the tongue way to say that, but Activity around this enzyme target was very much on your radar this year. 
what stood out to you? Well, it's interesting because like you said, this target has been around for a while, but there was a discovery back in 2016 of a synthetic lethal relationship that it has uh, that sort of reinvigorated the space and has paved the way for a new generation of programs. And it's been interesting to see some of that being explored, uh, at least preclinically at AACR. And the reason there's excitement around PRMT5 is it because it represents a pretty big precision medicine opportunity. And that's because there's a deletion in a gene MTAP, uh, which is found in up to 15% of cancers. Um, it's kind of a passenger thing where it gets co-deleted along with something else that's a tumor suppressor. And because there's this synthetic lethal interaction with that deletion, there's an opportunity to target tumors in a, a pretty broad range of cancers that might be sensitive to PRMT5 inhibition. And so the first wave of inhibitors were developed before that mechanism was known and didn't tap into it. But now uh, the emerging wave we're seeing is largely uh, looking to engage that tumor selectivity through the synthetic lethal mechanism. And rather than explain all the biology verbally, um, I encourage you to check out this story because we've got some images that sort of map it out and make it clear because there's a couple different layers to it. So how's this field playing out in terms of, is it a, a few core players who are the PRMT5 grandparents or parents or something like that? Or are people rushing in? Because I, I do feel that what you and Lauren tap into actually year after year is you do get these trends, right? Maybe this year is a trend away from immuno-oncology. We've had cancer metabolism come up now. In this case, we're sort of seeing a constellation of activity around a target. And so what do you think drives that behavior? Is it, is it a few pioneers really leading this forward or how, how, how does the field look? Well, it's interesting. Um... I think Tango uh, Therapeutics was one of the first to sort of plant a flag around a program that tapped into the synthetic lethal mechanism for tumor selectivity. And now we're seeing a range of companies do that. It was interesting to see Amgen and Marathi are both in this space with phase one, two compounds. And it looks like just poking around some of the other biology abstracts in the conference, there might be some crosstalk between the KRS biology and PRMT5 biology. It was also interesting to see AstraZeneca get into this space with a preclinical compound that they unveiled this year. And they've been big players in synthetic lethality, of course, uh, largely in the DNA damage response space. This is a little different. PRMT5 is a methyl transferase that controls gene expression by adding methylation markers to transcription factors, histones, et cetera. So it's, it's a bit outside of that DNA damage response world, but of course, some of the abstracts that we're seeing looking at combinations are, are showing that there might be crosstalk with the DDR space as well. And there are also a lot of smaller companies getting in the game with next generation PRMT5 inhibitors, and we've got those rounded up in the story. All right. Talking of KRAS, because you're never really that far away from KRAS on this podcast. Lauren's talked about it in terms of the products on the market in the past. Tell us what is the buzz that we're all, we should be paying attention to from ASCR this year. Well, there was a big sort of special session around KRS this year. They did a look back at what they called a 30-year overnight success story of the target and the drug development. And they also got into some of um, next generation approaches, which were also highlighted in a wide range of preclinical abstracts as well. I'm still digging through it, but one of the themes seems to be that there's some next generation players coming out with compounds that can target both the active and the inactive form of KRAS. The marketed inhibitors target just the inactive form. Revolution has come out with forms, compounds that target the active form. And there's some interesting plays from Frontier Medicine, for example, and, um, and others that are tapping in, trying to tap both. So that's an interesting uh, mechanism that will be probed out by some of these preclinical and, and earlier stage compounds coming up. All right. Now, another analysis we like to do here at Biocentry every year is to drill down into AACR's first in human abstracts, first in human studies being one lens into translational trends at the conference. There were 25 abstracts 
at the meeting this week that describe initial data from first in human studies or describe ongoing first in human studies from which data have yet to be disclosed. Lauren, another one of your analyses, what caught your eye the most? So first I want to say this is a, a relatively small data set. And as you said, it's one way to look at trends in translational science. But what I saw in this set is that trials of antibody drug conjugates outnumbered those of, of new maps. So just given the amount of excitement we've seen around ADCs over the past year or so with the inher 2 data in HER2 low breast cancer, with all of the deals that we've seen in recent months, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, these are sort of a next generation version of, of MAVs that use that antibody targeting potential to bring chemotherapies that would otherwise be too cytotoxic to use systemically to the tumor. Yeah, I think this just reflects the amount of excitement that we're seeing around that modality. So let, let's just dig in a minute because as you pointed out, like there's actually a whole bunch now of ADCs that are marketed and approved. And what we're really looking at is maybe even the third, not the second generation of these. So what are the technology advantages that these newer products are bringing, or are they just taking it against more targets, taking the technology against more targets is what I meant. Well, so stay tuned for that. That's not in this story, but that's something else that I'm looking into. But with the first in human studies, I don't see a ton of technology differentiation. I don't see a ton of target differentiation. So of the seven ADC trials, three are looking at HER2 as the target. You know, obviously there are already three of those on the market. The other ones are looking into targets that are already addressed by ADCs that have gone into clinical trials. And there are some subtle differences in the types of linkers that you use, the ratio of the antibody to the, the cytotoxic drug. There are things like that, that that make these differentiated. So I think more to come on how these specific ADCs will differentiate from the ones that, that are already marketed or that they're more advanced in clinical trials. But there are a lot of interesting things, I think, in preclinical development in the ADC space. You know, companies are testing ADCs that have more than one payload, and they're testing ADCs that target two different cell surface proteins on, on tumors. And they're using things other than antibodies, like antibody fragments or um, or other structures. There's a lot of interesting science behind this modality that is becoming less of a new modality, I think, as, as we're moving through the years. All right. Now, one of the uh, biggest pieces of data that people were looking to see at the conference were the latest melanoma data for the Merck and Moderna neo antigen vaccine combo. We did see top line data back in December. That data was very well received by investors. Karen, you have been following this since, uh, well, for several months now, and we got a further peek at the data, a fuller peek. What did you find? Well, it was interesting because the data cut was the same as for what was shared in December via top line results. But it garnered a much more pessimistic market response. It's the first randomized controlled trial for a neoantigen cancer vaccine. And it's also a place where Moderna might be staking out a foothold beyond infectious disease. And so there's a lot of scrutiny that goes into it. And so there was a lot of questions about the balance of molecularly defined subgroups across the Keytruda-only control arm versus the combination arm with the neoantigen cancer vaccine. For example, how many patients were TMB high versus low? We've got all that data in the story in a table. You know, it was a ratio of three to one high to low in the control group versus three to two in the combination group. So, you know, you can check that out and see for yourself. And they also had a poster kind of breaking down the hazard ratios by molecular subgroup. And what uh, to remind you what this trial is really looking for is a reduction in the risk of recurrence or um, an increase in recurrence free survival for patients who have had their melanoma tumor removed and are at high risk of recurrence. The idea is that vaccinating in combination with Keytruda can prevent the recurrence of the tumor. Um, and so they were looking at prevention of recurrence and death. What was interesting to me is there, there was a lot of chatter. There was the you know 8% stock drop. But talking to Merck, they seem 
pretty bullish on this program. Uh, not only are they launching a phase three, but they're also looking to take it beyond melanoma into other indications. Um, they named non-small cell lung cancer as a sort of top of the list. And they're doing something which we've captured in prior analyses. They're kind of pointing this in the direction of settings of low tumor burden. So a resected uh, tumor setting or an early stage setting because it's the neoantigen cancer vaccine space is sort of increasingly taking the view that that might be where this approach might have the most success. And then it was also interesting um, going back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier with Lauren looking at amino oncology and is it losing its luster? Uh, one of the things that we've been seeing is that it's, it's sort of hard to for another amino oncology agent to build on the efficacy of something like a checkpoint inhibitor. There's a few examples, but in general, lots of things have been tried and not as many have stuck. And one of the things that Merck was saying was that perhaps this combination of broad immune activation through a checkpoint inhibitor and then specific activation of an individual patient's immune responses against their specific tumor could hit that sweet spot in terms of building, layering on two immuno-oncology mechanisms. Right. And that, that's a point actually that came up recently when I chatted on the Biocentury show with Gilead CMO, my dad, Parsi, where I was talking with him about why it's been so difficult to get new checkpoint inhibitors that really proved themselves out after PD-1. Of course, LAG-3 does have a product approved. What I'm hearing from you, Karen, is that, you know, people have tried a lot of things, but do you really think that this is a different story? They're positioning in this as this might be the reason we've got these two different mechanisms coming in, might be the reason why these ones can be additive to a Keytruder, I suppose, or a, a checkpoint inhibitor. How much water do you think that holds that idea that this is substantially different? Well, I, I think that targeting antigen-specific responses uh, it is a different approach than sort of just lowering the threshold for, for immune responses the way a checkpoint inhibitor would. And so uh, it's that question of, you know, removing the brakes, stepping on the gas, and how do you step on the gas? The idea that the hypothesis behind the neoantigen approach is that your immune system has a better shot at taking on the mutations that have specifically arisen in this tumor because they are non-self. One of the things that is part of the process of generating a cancer neoantigen vaccine is identifying antigens that are expressed in the tumor tissue, but not in healthy cells. So I think that this is a mechanism that is substantially different from others that have been approached. You know, there's the tumor-associated antigens that people have tried to vaccinate for in the past, but those are fundamentally just upregulated in tumors, yet still present on some normal cells. So there is that kind of self component that gets in the way of immune responses. And, you know, we've been following the cancer neoantigen space since at least back in 2017. And so it's interesting to see it kind of reach this, uh, I call it adolescence, where we're soon going to have the larger phase three data that can more robustly test this hypothesis. And so I'm sure all eyes will be on that. Cool. So what I'm hearing from you is that it, it's plausible. It's plausible that um, using new antigens is substantially different and could move the needle on this. I don't know. The rest of you can't see Lauren's face, but I do. And she's not really, <laughs> she's, she's not really buying this quite so much. Lauren, what do you have to say? Yeah, I just, I think, I think maybe the amount of scrutiny, obviously this is Moderna and it's Merck and everyone's paying close attention, but I wonder what impact the commercial model for a personalized cancer vaccine has on how big of an impact you need to see on top of Keytruda for, for a neoantigen vaccine you know, that has to, I, and I don't even know what steps need to go into actually making these vaccines for individual people, but you know it's different than adding another MAB on top of Keytruda, I think. For sure. And you know, for what it's worth, when I asked Merck about the commercial model and scaling up, they seemed unworried. <laughs> they said the needle to needle time is about six weeks. They said, uh, you know, it's a simpler process than, for example, generating a personalized T cell therapy. And that the kind of 
pipelines of getting the tumor samples processed, identifying the neoantigens and generating uh, the mRNA that encodes them into a vaccine is a robust enough that they think it won't present those kinds of hurdles. But you're, you're right. It's a very, you know, anytime you have a personalized therapy, there's more that goes into that. And so will the efficacy warrant that kind of extra load from a manufacturing, et cetera, point of view? That's a very valid question. Right. And in parallel, we're going to continue to watch the manufacturing of cell therapies and you know, advanced therapies evolve because that is a separate whole field that is in need of innovation, let's say, and where really manufacturing advances could actually turn, Lauren's pointing out sort of something could be the difference in making something successful, both commercially and therefore for patients solving access. All right. All our AACR coverage is up on our website, biocentury.com. You heard Simone uh, reference her interview with Murdad Parsi, the CMO of Gilead on the BioCentury show. That's our sister podcast. You can find that wherever you get your podcast. You could also check out the webcast of that conversation up on our YouTube channel. Just Google the BioCentury show YouTube. You'll land right there. Today's podcast is brought to you by BioCentury's 23rd Bioequity Europe Conference. We are expecting record attendance at this year's conference, which takes place in mid-May in Dublin, Ireland. Register today. You'll meet more than 200 CEOs, 200 VCs, other decision makers from across the biopharma innovation ecosystem at the industry's premier CEO and investor conference. Visit bioequityeurope.com to learn more. Our friends at Kendall Square Orchestra provide the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Thanks for tuning in.